All right, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Sean Green, um, chair of the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods and have been uh, collaborating with folks around alternative shelters and villages um, and supporting them. This is a very special uh, forum we have today. Um, we've got some folks with us from the Low Income Housing Institute, um, which is doing work up in Washington. Um, they're an operator of um, uh, tiny house villages that serve unhoused folks. They also operate other types of housing and they also operate uh, urban rest stops, which provide hygiene facilities for folks uh, who are unhoused up in uh, the Seattle area. Um, before we get started, I'm gonna do, I'd like to take a moment to do a land acknowledgement. Um, thank you all for being here today. Today, as we come together virtually in Portland and across Oregon and Washington for reflection, learning, and action, let's take a moment to acknowledge and honor the land that we are on and its history. Our virtual forum is being centered on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Waskow, Cowlitz, Kalamath, Clackamas, bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malawa, and many other tribes who make this area their home. We would also like to acknowledge and honor the vibrant urban na native community with members of over 380 tribes from around the country who call the Portland metropolitan area home today. We pay respect and give thanks to the indigenous people for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. We give gratitude for their continued work and celebrate their rich histories, practices, and cultures that are tied to the land. I would encourage each of you to learn about the Native community's current issues, struggles, and calls to action. We acknowledge their enduring preser perseverance and resilience across generations. This calls us to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit, our community, and our future. Thank you. Um, I'd like to review the agenda really briefly uh, before we get started with our guests. So the first half of the agenda is going to be focused um, with our guests from the Low Income Housing Institute. Uh, we'll be learning about the work they've been doing up there with a, a particular focus on the operation of uh, tiny house villages that serve unhoused folks. Um, the second part of our agenda, we'll be talking about the work that um, uh, kind of this emerging coalition around uh, alternative shelters and villages has been doing um, and how we hope to continue that work and find ways to work together. Um, we'll be reviewing things like uh, a proposed um, uh, draft goal, kind of mission for our work, and some particular action items that we've identified to see if folks want to get involved to help. And with that, I'd, um, with that, I'd like to move on to the main part of our presentation, our very special guests from the Low Income Housing Institute. Um, we have Andrew and Bradford. And why don't we take a moment, why don't you introduce yourselves and then um, we'll kind of move into some background about the Low Income Housing Institute generally, and then let's focus on how you, how you, the work has evolved around the tiny house villages in particular. And with that, uh, Andrew and Brad. You go first. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so my name is Bradford. Thank you for um, the land acknowledgement and the introduction, Sean, and thanks to everybody for being on the uh, excited today, a uh, little bit nervous, haven't done a lot of like large group Zooms, um, and more from a kind of public meetings in person, um, but really happy to be here. So yeah, like I said, my name is Bradford. I've worked with the Low Income Housing Institute for about four and a half years um, on the tiny house project. Uh, at its beginning, it was not much of a tiny house project. It was more of a sanctioned encampment program uh, in partnership with several different groups in the grassroots level, nonprofit and uh, city um, and has now changed a lot. So uh, I'm a native of Washington, D.C. Um, I've been in Northwest for about five years. Um, and yeah, that's my introduction. 
Andrew, I pass it to you. Well, I'll start from the bottom. I also was born in Washington, D.C., strangely enough. Maybe that's why Brad and I get along so well. Um, for me, I was living my life. I'm a little older than I look. I'm 45. Playing Xbox and tending bar and not caring a fig for the fate of the world. Until rents grew so high here in Seattle that I kind of had to face facts that I couldn't afford to live in the city anymore. So my partner and I ended up becoming homeless, um, but we just had less challenges than a lot of other people on the street. I had always been like friendly to local homeless people, like, hey friend, here's a cigarette or let me buy some pizza. And so I started to kind of get to know them when we were financially struggling. And I was like, how are you guys surviving? And so then I came to need that. And those are the people that kind of looked out for me. I bounced around trying to stay in a few shelters. My partner stayed with family. And so we were dealing with, you know, the problem. And I found that, you know, the shelters were really terrible environments and it made more and more sense why people were camping. And so then I started doing that, became involved with like organized encampments and really had like a, an awakening to the humanitarian crisis that we're having in our in these cities and ended up instead of going back to tending bar and playing xbox working for political advocacy groups and nonprofits that introduced me um, to more structures and more people that were interested in doing this work and um, i've been working in tandem with lehigh uh, for about as long as brad has um, but only working directly for them as the tiny houses have kind of stabilized as this works for about a year and a half. That's great. I just wanted um, to say before we move on to, um, and I thank Carol, my one of our co-organizers for this, some general guidelines, you know, let's all listen with curiosity. Let's take a learning stance as we encounter some what might be new information for some of us and let's take care of our um, take care of yourself and if you need to uh, take a bio break or um, get up and stretch feel free to do that at any time we hope to have a short break in between towards um, towards the end the middle of uh, the session but take care of yourself okay why don't we hear a little bit about uh, the low-income housing institute uh, briefly um, it, the work it does um, as an organization, and I'll let either Brad or Andrew can speak to that. Yeah, I can start there. Um, one more process question or comment as well is, um, I am watching the chat feed, and so if for whatever reason there's like connectivity issues skipped over, someone asked what is Lehigh, that's a great question. We don't want to use too many acronyms, so please throw those in real time if you have questions and we'll try to stay on them. Um, and I also just wanted one more acknowledgement. There are actually a couple other folks from Lehigh that have made it on this call as well. Um, so we won't maybe start with intros of them, but if, um, if there is a question that seems perfectly suited for one of my coworkers, um, I will get in their direction. Um, my role at Lehigh is, I'm what's called a special projects manager. And so I've done um, more at the beginning of my work, a bit more of community organizing and have shifted more into project management um, kind of municipal partnerships, construction, volunteers, um, those those kinds of things. Some of my coworkers are more on the volunteer side, on the community engagement side, a number of things. There's a lot of different uh, angles to this. We have a team of, um, on the tiny house program, um, as kind of a central staff, it's about a dozen or so folks, maybe closer to 10, and wider at all of the different villages. We have a team of about 50 people that work on tiny house villages in Seattle, Tacoma, and Olympia. Um, and then looking, so the bigger question of what Lehigh does, um, Lehigh, which stands for the Low Income Housing Institute, um, has been around for about 29 years. Uh, Lehigh started uh, as an organization that was working with grassroots groups to convert, um, like the first property was the conversion of a motel hotel into affordable housing for a group of folks that were um, tent camping in a nearby city piece of property. Um, that was the beginning of Lehigh and its founding, uh, and it has grown from not only converting underused or unused parcels of land 
or properties into affordable housing, but um, developing scattered site affordable housing, multifamily units. Um, we're predominantly or primarily a, an affordable housing developer. So we have a team of developers with architect, construction manager, um, people that help loop in from multiple different sources at the county, state, federal, local, philanthropy level to help make affordable housing projects happen. Um, we also operate that affordable housing. So we have about 60 properties that are in five different counties in the Puget Sound area. So we're kind of like dispersed. And those, again, they look like 200 unit, you know, historic buildings in the downtown of Seattle to single family homes in a more suburban neighborhood for us. maybe it's single parents um, or women that are in recovery. So it's a lot of different housing types. We have staff that on site at housing projects um, and staff that do case management. So we also do supportive services and are um, kind of vertically integrated in that way. Um, other than just affordable housing in tiny house villages, which we'll speak about today, we also do have urban rest stops. Uh, in the early 2000s, uh, before there were tiny house villages, um, Lehigh you know, engaged with the city to develop um, kind of storefront property. Uh, they look a little bit like a retail center, um, not like unlike a coffee shop, um, but they have. Oh, we might have lost Bradford. Um, I, I can pick up there. The, yeah. He's talking about the urban rest stop. So it's like a storefront in a building and it provides laundry, showers, bathrooms for people experiencing homelessness. And, and I can say that for like Seattle um, residents that find themselves homeless, urban rest stops are kind of uh, like the library. Everyone uses them, everyone knows them. And in general, they're kind of treated like grandma's house. You know, people respect that space and there's, there's not a lot of trouble or drama there because it's, it's a shared resource for everyone. And, and they're great, we even need more of those. And I'll just say that on oh, the Low Income Housing Institute's website, there's a tab for the urban rest stops with some photos and some more information that folks want to check that out. It's, it's a really um, uh, worthwhile model for I think our community to explore as we look about ways of providing additional access to hygiene to our in-house community. And I think one thing worth mentioning is kind of like that connection of the sanctioned encampment, which became Tiny House Villages and Lehigh, which is a low-income housing provider, is those are the people they want to house. Those are the people that are going to meet the criteria that are going to get their housing. And so Lehigh has an interest in engaging with the encampments, which later became the Tiny House Villages. Um, and I, I think it's a, a virtuous circle. Great. I think that's a great um, overview. If there's anything else you want to add about uh, Lehigh or the Low Income Housing Institute, you can feel free to add it. But I think it's probably a good time to move on to how, um, how did tiny house villages come to be in the Seattle and Puget, uh, Puget Sound area? And I think it's okay for us to maybe focus on the pick a jurisdiction like Seattle um, as we think about doing similar things in, in Portland. So I'm interested to hear a little bit about kind of the evolution of the activism and the policy that led to um, my understanding five years ago, the ordinance that legalized um, sanctioned encampments and how that led into tiny house villages and maybe touching on the most recent um, reauthorization and expansion of the, the policy program within Seattle. Yeah. <clears throat> I, can, I can answer that from my perspective and then Andrew would love your thoughts on, on my answer and your feedback. Um, so uh, this was about, you know, really six years ago, but the story could go back decades um, that Seattle has had a, a really um, strong system of self-managed and self-organized tent city and um, encampment communities in this area. Um, those started with Cher, Nicholsville. They had a number of different tent cities that were uh, ranging from downtown to more South Seattle, North Seattle, East Side. Um, there are a lot of different names and they've changed over the years, but um, all of this work really stems on 
the shoulders of those original advocates who've been working incredibly hard. Um, we you know, live in a climate now where the kind of the politics, the discussion, the language supports um, encampments. And we talk about like regulation, we talk about ordinances, we talk about tiny house villages. Um, and I can only imagine, I was not doing this work 20 years ago, but I can only imagine what it would have been like. Um, Nicholsville was one of those communities and they, uh, they were formed out of protest and they were moved, you know, in, uh, in part forced by the police to move more than a dozen times uh, and the shared communities similarly. So Seattle has had ordinances for a while that allowed for tent cities to stay in one location and it was primarily faith properties for about three months at a time. So they had to move every single three months. Um, it was tumultuous, but I think people would attest to it having brought communities together and created a really strong sense of like camaraderie and um, kind of peer support to be going through those, those moves regularly. Um, but it was not supportive. In particular, it wasn't supportive to um, A, creating a solid sense of place where there could be services and B, building out an infrastructure. And so I think it was five years ago now um, that those communities, um, you know, origin, our original partnership as the Low Income Housing Institute with Nicholsville and Share was actually to simply provide land that we were um, slated for development on that was unused vacant land, which I'm sure everybody knows exists in communities, and to invite Nicholsville to stay on that property. And so they were staying on our property. We were not deeply engaged in any of the operations at that point. Um, and it was right around that time that uh, the city began to, um, I wouldn't say that it was cave in necessarily, but they, it was probably a mixture of both caving in and um, seeing some other models that were starting to work and seeing that those models also had really strong grassroots organizations at the foundation of them. So they opened with Mayor Ed Murray, uh, a transitional encampment ordinance. And that ordinance allowed for up to three transitional encampments. The word tiny house was never mentioned. Um, and they could be on public or private property in the city. Um, and before that, there's, there were two ordinances that we were working with. Before that, there was an allowance for uh, sanctioned encampments on faith property, but it hadn't been used extensively. And there was still the three month requirement, or at least um, it was, it was, you know, that stay was being kept to three months for those 10 cities. So with these two ordinances in hand and with the city expressing an interest to fund some of the operations, fund some of the supportive services and fund some of the infrastructure, although it was very limited. Um, Lehigh, Nicholsville and Share went in all to a joint effort and we opened three locations. Again, they, the first two were not tiny house villages. They were more of um, tents on tent platforms with uh, temporary kitchens that were built on kind of a two by six framed platform, um, sometimes off grid utilities. Um, for example, maybe it would be honey buckets gray water stations not hooked up to sewer but hooked up to water and to power um, and then there was one specific site that kind of changed things it was on faith property it was not funded by the city um, it was not funded by the city in opening or in operations it was called the tiny house village at the lutheran church of the good shepherd and that was the first project that actually showcased could we do tiny houses all in one place could we not do tents on a location? Could we add showers and hook in with all of the municipal utilities? Um, and how much would it cost? And so that was Nicholsville doing some of the management for that site and folks that were living in the community really maintaining the community and looking after each other and the space. Um, and I think that was a big shift, just showing you know, the possibility that's included when, when they extended themselves for an encampment ordinance and all of a sudden the community and the organizers put forward a tiny house village. The city had never intended on doing a tiny house village. Um, it was someone at the city who, I don't know if it was begrudgingly or if they just went out on a limb, but they said, if you build it under 120 square feet, uh, you don't need a building permit per the international building code. Um, that was not the intention of the mayor. It was not the intention of anyone else at the city when they saw the first tiny house going to the site. Apparently there was a story of you know, someone who worked at the city standing there with their hand up saying, what are you doing with this thing? There's no permit for this. Um, as soon as she left, we dropped it onto the site and said, we don't need a permit. This is the alternative to a tent and this is going to work a lot better for people. Um, and that was how the best practice was built. Sometimes it was 
through deep partnership and planning. And sometimes it was through going out on a limb and doing something creative and showing that it wasn't illegal and we were meeting people's needs. Um, fast forward more in time and um, we began to convert all of the tents at some of those locations into tiny houses. Um, there were these kind of consecutive waves of political interest. So uh, the first wave was three tiny house villages, sort of like a pilot. The second wave was a realization that this is actually really effective. People are moving into permanent housing. It's a great place for case managers to work with folks um, where they don't have to wear hiking boots to meet with their clients. Their clients can come to the office that they have at the location. And the city decided to invest in three more, uh, two of them on city property and one of them on private property that our organization owns. Similarly, we'll, we'll begin development on that property soon and it, it moved. Um, those villages, again, were big successes. And so the city, again, invested in another three villages. So it's always been in these waves um, where the city has been kind of shown a lot of interest. Three villages, for some reason, that's been the number. Three villages have come from a wave of interest, a wave of um, council voting and, and financial allocation, uh, a little bit of break, and then another three villages. Which brings us now to having 10 villages in Seattle, um, the newest of which are all hooked up into public utilities. They all have tiny houses at the locations. All of the tiny houses have uh, heat, power, electricity, lights, they're insulated. Um, they can all be accessible. So we have like accessible ramps through the site so people can get into them. Uh, there are hot showers, laundry, um, at almost all of them flushed toilets. So actually flushing toilets, but not at all of them. Some still don't have um, sewer capacity for black water or um, sewage and uh, like communal areas. So that's a little of the history and, and maybe Andrew, you can comment more on, on that early history I talked to. And, and Andrew, if you're comfortable, um, maybe you could talk about some of your personal experiences as part of that history. Sure. So, so um, when I, you know, came in need of uh, the tent cities and started being involved with them staying there myself, then I saw that it was really like um, a lot of the faith partners that would be interested in an encampment and, um, you know, help them with things like, here's some paper towels, that type of stuff. Um, here's some blankets. And then the group was self-managing. And so that was often spearheaded by one of the like homeless advocate groups in Seattle, like Nicholsville. Um, and, you know, so in that crucible, you know, the leaders kind of emerge from that. Like you have Ibrahim Mubarak in Portland, who I'm friends with. And so that's these kind of figures that kind of emerge in those environments where, you know, it's like, um, it's, it builds community for people to have that shared struggle. And I think that, you know, being a part of it, it's like, you see that it's a good thing. You see that it's stable and helping people. And one of the ways like you get neighborhoods to be kind of tolerant saying this encampment can be here for a couple months and how it eventually led into something bigger is by proving itself every step of the way. And, and I think one of the bargaining chips that you can offer is by having a time limit. You know, this encampment is going to be here for three months was our first step, right? So kind of getting people to accept that, that there were people in need and I was a member of like Tent City Three and getting people to accept three months was hard enough. But once you do and nothing crazy happens, uh, then they're like, hey, that was actually a pretty good experience, you know, for the neighbors. Um, it's helping people. We like the, the tent encampment and they're welcome back at some later point. And that, that's kind of like the road that we took to get here. And then the village that I'm at right now today is called Interbay Village, but it was originally called Tent City Five. So it was the first city sanctioned tent encampment. It was a couple blocks down the street. We moved and upgraded to all tiny houses. Um, but I was there on the first day um, just because living at some of the tent encampments, like I said, those leaders will emerge and they're like, hey, we're gonna start a new tent encampment. The, the city is sanctioning one and we need people that can help create a stable community. You know, and so kind of, each one seeding the next, you know, like some of the campers that were the most responsible, that cared the most, we would split that and germinate the next group. 
That's great. Um, I know that folks are really interested to talk about um, how things are working now and the best practices, but I, I wonder if we could, before we do that, just maybe, um, from what I'm hearing from you all is there's been this evolution, um, trial, error, that has built up over time, and it wasn't, it wasn't as though um, one day the current um, the current versions of the tiny house villages existed. It it took this evolution. Um, is that is that something that um, you think is just part of the ecosystem within the politics of making these types of communities work? And as we navigate that within our own communities, do you have any advice for us? Well, I'd say number one is every new community that you create, you're, it's going to be an iteration upon the last. You're going to learn lessons that are impossible to predict when you start. You know, so it, it's, you can think, hey, we've thought everything through. And then on the very first day, you're going to find yourself in a no-win situation, usually internal or difficult, like, okay, we filled every tiny house, just one example. And there's lots of people benefiting from it and we're up and running and we have every house filled. Now this couple doesn't get along and they want to separate. So who leaves? Where do you, where do you put the other person? So there's, there's your first problem where there is no solution. And so you're like, okay, um, I guess next time we have a house open, we separate them. You know, is this a dangerous situation? And, and so we've gone through that like a million times, you know, encountering all these no-win situations time and again. Um, even things like uh, we have a site, the city's going to allow it, we have the funding for it, and some random person wants to sue you and do an environmental study on the soil so you can't use one third of it. Now all your plans are out the window and you know it, it's a challenge for sure. So I think that being ready to be flexible and you know listening to new ideas, you know, and I, I think Lehigh does a really good job at that, is just adapting in the moment. Um, but you have to be willing to do what's going to work, you know, not just focusing on your ideals of what you think will work. I think, and let Brad, I'll, I'll give you, uh, Bradford, I'll give you an opportunity to, to add to that, but I think that is a great segue into talking about all of the learning that you've experienced over time and what things look like now based on that learning. But before we go there, Bradford, do you have anything to add about kind of the evolution and maybe advice for, for our community? Yeah, I do. Um, I think that there, I could imagine this having gone thousand different directions, different ways. Um, there's no, like there was no one road that we knew that we were going to be going on when this started. Um, I think that partnerships shifted and changed. New partners came in, older partners, you know, were split ways from. Um, so I don't think, I think that inherently based on every community and the resources and all the different groups doing different work that are there, some partnerships are going to come out that might seem really great and then they may fade away. There's no one there's no one exact model for this. And it will, I'm sure, take some, some method of trial and error. Um, and you know, we're now at a, a space, a very unique place, which I think to folks that are in the city probably is not the most comfortable place, which is in Seattle, there is one contracted agency that does tiny house villages. There's only one. And for anyone that works at the city in this group, that's probably not the best situation to be in is to have one contractor that is providing an essential resource. There are other shelters in the city. There are other enhanced shelters in the city, but Lehigh is the only group that does tiny house villages. Uh, Nicholsville and Cher still do exist and they still do run programs and shelter people and work really well. Um, but we have since moved away from that. And there are now 10 villages in the city of Seattle that we work with. So I don't know if that's that certainly did not have to be the case. There could have been along that way other nonprofits that might have been interested. And, and we encouraged it. And the city went out and, and said, is anybody else interested in doing this work? And no one responded. Um, but I do think that just, just acknowledging that there are so many different ways to move and that all those different ways to move are important and necessary to fulfilling the needs because you know our 10 villages are still not 
they're making change and they, they matter, but uh, we're, not, we're not meeting our goal of sheltering everyone. So yeah. it, it has to look different. So it's not like, you know, there's the tip of the spear and then that's it. It's like many, maybe many different angles to this. Great. Thank, thank you, Bradford. So I think now's a great time to move into, based on all that learning, what does, what does a tiny house village look like now and how does it operate? Maybe we could start from like the form and function of it, like the number of tiny houses, the, the resources which you've already touched on that exists on the site, but then also talk about, um, I know that you have different management styles depending on the particular village. Um, and I know folks have been asking some questions specific to about how do sites get identified and developed and um, things like that. So let's start there and then we can work into kind of some more specific questions. I mean, eventually we'll touch on, I, I know folks want to touch on costs, they want to touch on governance, conflict resolution. So we'll move into those other categories, but let's start with kind of the basics. Well, I, I think that the typical tiny house village, you know, so there's 12 of them, like in the greater uh, Seattle area, um, nine of them specifically in Seattle, the typical village is usually going to have about 50 to 60 villagers living at it, um, possibly including children, some have children. Um, and what I, I mean, the reason for that, from my perspective, is that's usually going to be as much as you can comfortably fit into the property that's available. But there's also social reasons for it too, that villages that usually have less than 20 people can be slightly unstable because one villager who's disruptive is too high of a percentage, right? So that village probably needs more staffing. Um, and villages start to self-correct often when you're hitting at, at about 40 to 50 people. You know, so that one individual can't create that much of a disruption in a group that large. And it, it's a healthy size. Any larger than that, like why not just do one with 100 or 200 people? Um, then the villagers don't know each other. They don't know each other's names. You don't know everyone that lives there. You know, you can't recognize them. And so that's unstable too. You know, it, the problems are not worth the time consumption. As far as the other types of modeling, um, you know, there can be one with a high amount of staff or a low amount of staff. So at the village I'm at, which is the first tent encampment uh, that was sanctioned, I work here and we have a case manager and we have a part-time case manager. And so when I'm not here, you know, the villagers elect leaders and those, those leaders have responsibilities. And I meet with the leaders once a week to kind of collaborate on problem solving. Um, more current villages, uh, this is like an older model, the self-managed model, um, that we found that the demographic shift in homelessness is, you know, this model isn't suited for people with severe addiction, mental health issues, medical issues. So more and more villages have 24-hour staff, have controlled access. It's pretty much the same, except less responsibility shifted to the villagers. Uh, but obviously that's going to cost a little bit more um, but it's going to solve a lot of problems. Um, even though there is a, you know, a beauty to the, the self-managed group, but th those t are very time intensive for sure. Uh, most of the villages having about 50 people are gonna usually have 40 to 45 tiny houses that people live in, um, almost all except couples, uh, many except children, we accept pets. Um, and then we have separate facilities like a kitchen, which is going to be like a, a separate structure, uh, showers, a separate structure, and um, you know, like sitting areas, things like that. Great. And in terms of the structures themselves, um, what are they like? What's in them and how are they built? Um, I can comment on that. Um, so the structures themselves are all roughly eight by, by 12 feet. So they have to be under 120 square feet. Uh, that includes the eaves on the front and the sides and the back of the house. So it's the total roof line area. It has to be under 120 square feet. Um, but they're eight by 12, two by four constructed walls. 
Um, usually we'll do like a plywood interior sheathing rather than a drywall, vinyl flooring, um, R13 insulation, and uh, 25 year asphalt roof. You know, the houses are, um, they're all built by volunteers, which I, I, and I have a, a presentation that I can bring up. It feels so much more organic to have this conversation this way though. Um, they're, they are all built by volunteers, originally all built actually by students. So it was student groups, it was pre-apprenticeships, it was CTE programs uh, that built the first units. And from there it ballooned into the wider community, into faith congregations, you know, a master home builder who has an empty driveway and a free weekend. Uh, they can be built in three days if you have a couple people that really know how to build um, and you can build them really solid. Um, you know, there's no, there's no, they don't need to be built with like fiberglass. I've heard of like, there's a whole industry now for like, tiny houses that can be constructed that are just like bulletproof, pressure washable, no bed bugs, no, you know, where it's like they're selling you like two inches of plastic completely and, and they look like space age. Um, I totally feel like that's an amazing place for an industry to grow and for people to, to like discern if that's what they want. I also think that like there are building experts and there is the building science for these to still be cheap and still be made of wood and still be insulated and not need to be made of like, you know, space age ply core. Um, they can be really solid and, and still have wood construction and vinyl flooring. Um, but they yet all have, um, have like a duplex um, kind of power device. So our electrician comes in and he's just a, a general contractor or a contracted electrician. Um, all that work has to be done by uh, licensed contractors, the plumbing and the electrical. There's no plumbing in the units, but there is a duplex outlet, a light switch, and then run into the center of the ceiling or on the wall is a light bulb. Uh, and that provides uh, power for each tiny house, uh, charging and heat. So was there, I didn't know if there was another question in there, Sean. Um, no, I think that answers most of it. And then looking at the, the pictures of these, it looks like they're just set on pure, just concrete pure foundations. Is that correct? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. They're set on uh, sometimes just cinder blocks, um, but they're set on, they don't need a formal a seismic foundation, um, in part because they're not hooked up to sewer, which I think is the main concern with seismic foundations. Um, and I actually, there was one thing that, that just came up earlier, and it was something that Andrew had talked about related to operations. Um, if I could just touch to it, it feels like an important point. Um, mm -hmm. One thing I just want to add is uh, the way that operations um, connects in with supportive services is, I think, a very, very important conversation point with any program and has been something that I think we've really learned a lot about and that you know Andrew can definitely speak more to is um, having a case manager on site having supportive services you know there to work with folks and having a site manager um, I think there's like a we, we've gone through many different stages where at some point supportive services was kind of siloed from operations and operations was the place where if you have questions about what's going on in the village, if you have comments, if you have concerns, go to operations, do not go to the case manager. They are there exclusively to talk about getting into support of you know, permanent housing, that is their role. Um, and that was the place where we started. These are siloed functions. Uh, and I think at, over time we've learned that they can't be so neatly siloed. They do need to have explicit roles and they do need to have very clear articulation of, of, you know, when this happens, this is the person that you talk to, you know, when like not, not playing the supportive services side off of the operations side or vice versa. Um, but they can't be siloed in that site staff and management and leaders aren't working with case managers to understand what are the alternatives to an exit, right? What might be going on in someone's life that supportive services can help with that also has an operations impact. And, um, and let me give an example, just so it's super clear. Uh, let's say that Billy likes to collect bicycle parts and they're surrounding his tiny house and that's unacceptable for operations, right? That we have some expectations that people are going to keep an area nice and tidy. So now we're on the 20th time I've talked to Billy about the bicycle parts mm -hmm. and he won't listen. So wh what do you do? Is Billy leaving? Am I picking up bicycle parts and throwing them away? Is that legal? So the thing is, is in the past, having them siloed like Brad's describing, I might not realize 
that the, the case manager is trying to help Billy address some of his mental health issues that uh, manifest as hoarding, but I don't know that. And so discipline probably isn't the right step there. Um, and so the case manager and any operational uh, person that's fulfilling like the property management role, they need to work together so that we're always trying to act in the best interests of the villager. And, and I'll just add there to the, um, and at the same time, um, I think some like some perceived and, and for folks that do supportive services work, that's not my profession and I have a huge amount of respect for it, that that perceived like sacredness of that relationship also is important that it doesn't feel like whatever someone is talking to with the case manager becomes spilled beans with all of the site staff, right? That there still is some, some important kernel of privacy and anonymity within those relationships because, you know, site staff, it, I think it's, it's not the goal that they, um, that they are separate from residents. And, and Andrew can attest to it too, but a lot of our, whether it's a village organizer role, which is someone who's, you know, basically at the village 24 seven, and that position is called a village organizer, whether it's a site coordinator role or a special project manager role, um, I think a lot of our staff have lived experience, have lived in tiny houses, currently do live in tiny houses, have lived in 10 cities in the past. And I think it's really important that that, that relationship and that kind of peer connection between staff and residents be maintained without people feeling like their most intimate secrets are being revealed. Uh, before we wrap up on kind of the form, um, I just wanted to ask a couple questions about what size sites could accommodate you know, 50, 50 folks and um, what, what other infrastructure is there? Is there perimeter fence? Um, are there other things that maybe we haven't touched on that might be kind of some of the basics of how they're set up physically? Yeah, has, um, why don't I, if it works, can I show this presentation and just sure. flick through some of the slides? Cool, just for people who haven't seen some of this. Okay, can people see this presentation here? Yeah, perfect. Cool, okay. So I'll just, uh, I'll narrate a little bit and I'll move through it. I'll just spend a couple minutes just for pictures, but uh, this is Tiny House Village. This was that first project I mentioned at the Lutheran Church of the Good Shepherd. Uh, the village actually has since moved off of this property. Um, this location is being developed into affordable housing in partnership with the church which is a Lutheran church in the central area of Seattle. One thing I wanna add here, Brad, quickly looking at this photo. So I worked as a yeah. community organizer uh, for this village and we can see that there were only about 14 tiny houses. So at any given time, there were about 15 to 16 villagers and it was lightly staffed. So I, I, I can promise you the social drama that unfolded between villagers was the most time consuming thing like you, you'll spend more time dealing with the drama at a village like this ever than at a larger one. So don't, don't think that the small ones are easy. Thanks, Andrew. This is, that's an important point because right now we're considering as a city what size to allow um, these types of villages through a code process. And mm -hmm. right now the thought is 20, 20 structures. And I, some of this feedback is really important as we have these policy discussions. So I appreciate that. I can also add just on that point, um, it's not in this presentation, but there is a village in Olympia that um, is an interesting case study. They have eight tiny houses and it's largely managed. It's sort of co-managed. Co Lehigh plays a role. We have a supportive services person that's on site and the congregation plays a little bit more of an operations support role. It's called Hope Village. And um, I would just say that I think if they were here now, they'd probably attest to it was more than they thought it would be. Um, it's not, if it's eight tiny houses, it's not a 10th of the amount of organizing as if it was 80. Um, it actually has been a lot. Uh, they decided not to do a perimeter fence, for example. They just said, you know, they, they made a lot of decisions, I think, in thinking that it would be really small and that it wouldn't have a lot of issues that the, as the congregation perceived. And I think what came up a lot was residents having disputes with other residents. It was, you know, so again, that's just small, doesn't mean necessarily that your staff is, um, your staff or your support 
is based on like a per unit basis, but there is an economy of scale within that. Perfect, thank you. Um, so just quickly, this, this is a tiny house village. Um, this was like the opening day, so it, it doesn't look quite like this. Um, I'll just move quickly through. Um, so I'll, I'll share this presentation after with you, Sean, and, and maybe you can send it to people if they're interested. This just has some, some interesting footnotes about what tiny house villages are and are not um, that people might be interested in seeing. Um, going from the right to the left, on the right side, this is like permanent affordable housing. Um, this is like the Fry Apartments or the Glen Apartments in Seattle or the Marion West Apartments. These are apartment buildings that Lehigh has developed and manages. Uh, where there's again 50 to 200 units or it's like scattered site housing where it's a residential single family home and bedrooms are rented out in independently. Um, the next one, so this is again, it's like, it's very expensive. The average construction cost for an affordable housing unit in Seattle is about $375,000 to build one unit of affordable housing. Um, but the next one over, this moves into like small houses. They are fully equipped, they may have toilets and showers. Um, they're small and so it's more cost effective. You can engage in modular construction methods. You can use really like interesting or otherwise unusable pieces of property. Like when in Seattle, the light rail, um, Sound Transit purchased a whole bunch of properties to create the light rail. And now there's all of these weird little cut spaces um, or a property may be zoned such that it's very low density. So it doesn't make sense to do and you really can't do without a rezone, a large multifamily construction project, but you could do cottages or something small, but those are fully permitted and their cost ranges from a hundred thousand to $200,000. So a significant reduction in cost, but it's still a large cost. Um, and then I think what we're talking about here is tiny houses in the box, um, tent encampments. So either organized or unorganized um, to the right of that blue box, uh, that is more like the tent cities, more like Nicholsville, um, organized communities of people that are just like banding together and working with each other. And uh, maybe it's not invested in by a city, maybe it is. Maybe there's some investment in honey buckets and sink and case management. Um, but you know, the difference between those really does lean on the structures and uh, some of like the funding sources that may be different. Um, I also, I have a little about permits here, but um, with tiny house villages, the, there is a permit for the village. So the village itself may get a permit, um, whether it's in Portland, but from Seattle, from the county, if it's in an unincorporated area, there's sometimes a permit for the infrastructure. So we, for example, have had to get permits for laundry buildings, shower buildings, hygiene centers, things that are bigger than 120 square feet or that do have water plumbed to them. That's a separate process, those structures. But the buildings themselves, the houses, they don't have a permit. They don't need a permit. They get inspected for electrical, but they don't need a permit. Um, and then just briefly looking at some pictures, and I, again, I'll send this out. Um, this is, I think, a really good image, but um, just like four different attributes to a village. Um, there's gathering spaces. This one has a geodesic dome. Um, we won't, I don't think, we had a good experience with that dome, so we will not be doing a dome like that again, but we tried. Um, community spaces in terms of like open areas. Oh, wait. It leaked. Um, yeah, so in this village, the bottom left uh, shows what is like a family area. This is a village that serves, I think it's about a quarter of the houses are, if not reserved, they're predominantly um, serving families with kids. So that village has 34 tiny houses and at its maximum, it had as many as uh, 14 children that were in the village. Um, and then the bottom right is community space. So fridges, cooktop, sink with hot water. Um, we can't do like a stove and an oven gas because the fire department won't let us. We usually do these things under um, a large tent. So it might be like a wedding style tent, typically one that you'd rent, but they're, they can be really strong. We've also had uh, we've done metal carports as those structures. They can't, you don't get them permitted. And so you can't do something that's like rigid structure. Um, but a carport is something that we have done, which uh, takes a lot of engineering. There are some products on the market that I'm sure people could find a community tent that's usually 20 by 20 or 20 by 40. 
you know, um, and, and then for hygiene I, as we again, as we look at those pictures, Brad, I, I can say I've known dozens of villagers that have lived in these specific units that have gotten housing and that have moved forward in their lives. You know, it just makes me think about all the people that each individual, uh, each individual village has helped. You know, that the house isn't just one person's house. It ends up being 30 people's tiny house, you know, as they transition moving forward in their life. Um, and then this is just an example of different hygiene options. So this was like a SIP panel constructed trailer that was purchased for about, I think it was like $70,000 for a trailer that had laundry hookup, laundry room at the end, three bathroom, shower, toilet, sink units um, with all the water heaters on a trailer, uh, which was great because it didn't need a permit. It was on a trailer. It was quite expensive. Um, some of these other options are more built infrastructure. Um, and when we look at the bottom right one, difference. that that tower there, mm -hmm. you, you see people coming up with designs that have no idea what they're designing for because our first villagers that are in a wheelchair have no access to those showers upstairs. So later we had to redesign the bottom to add an accessible shower. So, so don't let architects design your village when they've never been there. Um, yeah, and that I think is like the end of the portion of just looking at the infrastructure. Um, if there were more specific questions though, I think Sean, you asked about a fence and they all do have fences. Um, mm -hmm. Whether it's a cedar fence, whether it's a cyclone fence, um, they all do have a perimeter fence around the whole site. Sometimes it's six feet, sometimes it's six feet with two feet of lattice on top. Um, I think we've learned a lot about like, does the door lock from the outside? So somebody has to come and let them in or is it just something that's passed through? And I think that just varies village to village. More so now we have doors that lock from the outside. So someone has to come in and there's a doorbell, but um, Georgetown Village, Interbay Village, Camp Second Chance, most of those places because there's someone who's you know, on security 24 seven. Um, and simply, I think the experience of the village has, has yielded an unlocked door. Yeah. And so in terms of um, the site size that would be needed for kind of a village that could support 50 folks, what square footage are we talking about? Yeah, usually we would say that um, it's somewhere between 350 and 400 square feet per residential tiny house. That's our model. And that includes the square footage that's taken up by the community kitchen, the community open spaces, the bathroom and the shower. So if, if looking at like one of our site plans, if any single one of them, you were to take the whole square footage and divide it by the number of units that people are staying in, because some of the units, you know, we always have, have one for storage. There's always one for the office. There's always one for the case manager. So if you divide that number by the occupiable units, you get somewhere between 350 and 400 square feet. Um, so for every tiny house of space, which is 100 square feet, you need approximately two more tiny houses of space for all the other amenities. And, and it's oh. really important too that storage becomes a big issue at the tiny house village. Like say you have like a care packages for new villagers that include like a blanket or hygiene stuff. Where do you keep it? You know, um, if you have a villager that moves out or just disappears on you one day, where do you store their belongings? You know, and you don't want to let the tiny houses that people live in go to waste. You want to always have those ready to turn over. So you're going to need to store tools and paint and, you know, cleaning supplies. And it's, it's really a big challenge. Like my tiny house office and the case manager's office are filled to the brim with stuff for the village. So you, it's really important to think about where you're going to keep things. Yeah. Um, and most most of these, or a village supporting about the 50 to 60 folks, how many tiny houses are in that type of? It, it really depends on if you're going to have couples. So if couples are allowed, um, which they probably should be, but it definitely opens a whole new can of worms of social issues, um, that 
I, like at this village, we have 51 adults and four children here. We have 42 tiny houses um, that people live in. So if you have about 40 tiny houses, you're going to approach 50 villagers. Great. And it, it's interesting that it's not such a straightforward answer sometimes. I know that um, when we did the project in the city of Olympia, we did a village called Plum Village. And you know, we, I think that the, the city thought that on this piece of property, it's such a great piece of property, we should be able to, you know, to provide housing for 50 people. And they hadn't done a site plan, they hadn't looked at it, there had been no architect to look at that. And so when we actually scoped it out, we could only fit 30 tiny houses. Um, but this idea of 50 people was still there and they were adamant about 50 people. And so when we opened, they said, and half of the village is for couples. And it was like, okay, that's an interesting, like that's sort of like letting the cart, you know, drag the horse forward as opposed to thinking about like, how do you program around the space and the constraints of the space? Uh, and sure enough, I think the city even had a hard time identifying enough couples to meet this 50 person maximum that their city council had, had talked about wanting. Um, again, there's been some in the city of Tacoma, um, we did a tiny house village that was there. And for some reason there was like, we want to serve 50 people. And that village only had 24 tiny houses. And so at the beginning, the city was basically saying, you have to try and double people up. You have to try and <laughs> allow two people. To that would be a terrible idea. You can. It was, and it didn't, it didn't work and it stopped working. And so it as people moved out or moved on, we just stopped doubling people up or even saying, you know, can you, we just let people come and stay as their own family unit and not try to have two people in one space. It did not work. So I can tell you, Hattie uh, from Georgetown is here right now. That's my partner. We spent two years living in a tiny house before we got housed. And being in 120 square feet with your partner, they will drive you crazy. So imagine doing that with a stranger. You know, don't ever do that. It's a, it's a terrible concept. And also, I think that it, what Brad is describing is there's a real temptation to say, these three houses are reserved for couples. These three houses are reserved for people with children. These three houses are reserved for veterans. When, when you do that, you're, what you're doing is setting up a system that will get gamed. You know, that as soon as you only have one opening and that opening mm -hmm. is only for couples, two people that are homeless will say, hey, we're a couple, we'll live there. And how do you disprove that? This is my brother, can't we cohabitate? Don't set up the game, right? You know, focusing too much on reserving for who you think deserves it, it's, it's self-sabotaging. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a perfect segue into getting into some other aspects of how um, the villages operate. Um, so why don't we touch on what what is if someone what is the process to to bring people into a village um, and maybe you could describe um, what you think the best process would be I know that there's some regulations in the city of Seattle that make things a little bit more difficult um, and then also in terms of getting people um, bought into um, the social dynamics and um, helping manage conflict. Maybe we could touch on. Could, you, could well, you say that first question one more time? Sure. The, so I think uh, folks entering a village, what's that process like? And I know in previous conversations, there's some certain quirks um, in Seattle, but if you were to set up that process, what would it look like? And, um, and what would be included both in terms of not only identifying who joins a particular village, but also like, is there like an agreement sign that says we acknowledge the rules associated with, with living here? And then how is conflict managed if those rules are broken? I, I have too much to say about it. Brad knows this. Look, I see Hattie smiling. Um, so who gets in? Who has an intake? Uh, I have a, say I have an open tiny house today. How does the next villager get selected? So, I, I mean, I like to, describe the backdrop before giving an answer, you know, walk you around the park. So number one, it shouldn't be me. I shouldn't pick. I don't believe that. I don't think that that's healthy uh, to have someone have the responsibility of saving someone's life, often literally, 
you know, so there needs to be a, a, like a fair process to do it, definitely. Um, but the thing is, is no one wants the responsibility of dealing um, with the stability of the village, but everyone wants to take credit for its success. So when the city sees the encampments as a problem, they don't want to deal with it. But when it's working, they want credit for it. So the city is kind of twisted our arm as an organization to put us in a deal with the devil um, to say, we want to select your new villagers. So the city wants to create a navigation team. Obviously there's problems with that if you're, you know what's happening in Seattle where they sweep an encampment. And then when they go to the sweep, they pick someone and they know there's an opening at the village because we're forced to report it to them. And then they pick the person and they send them to the village and then wash their hands of it, right? They don't want to know anything about it. They don't care that the person reaches the village in a meth-induced psychotic state. And that's our problem. And if we have a problem with it, then we should just throw the person back out onto the street. But that's not what Lehigh does. Mm -hmm. You know, Lehigh wants to give everyone a chance. And I agree with that. That's why I like working for them. You know, they believe that housing is a human right. So we're going to give everyone a chance, but it does make it difficult. Um, and it can often be destabilizing to the community of the village, you know, that when you have um, someone who has severe mental health issues and you have 40 other villagers living there, you know, it, that conflict is so endless that it's hard to manage it. And you don't want to spend all your time doing that anyway, you know, you want to help people move forward. Um, so that's a challenge. I think that giving away your power of intake is not a chip you should ever bargain with, you know, and at the same time, the other pole, which is a negative, is creaming. And that means that you only take people that are easy to work with. You cannot do that, you know. That is another evil that you can fall into, where this person has an indoor voice and is polite. This person talks very loud. We don't want them here. They're going to create trouble, you know. And so I found that often um, the village needs to serve helping those that need help, you know. And so don't be afraid to work with people that desperately need a chance, you know, that they need it. Um, and also, you know, you have to be mindful. If someone is unstable or dangerous, then this probably isn't the best model for them. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add um, a couple of points there. I think what Andrew said about those two evils on opposite sides, I think that's really well said. Um, we, we have slowly, and within Seattle, if people know, um, our city council just um, passed legislation to disband the navigation team in its current form. So the navigation team has historically been uh, really centering the, the referral power, the referral capacity of all of our shelters in the city onto one uh, small group of people within the human services department who also constantly leverage, um, they leverage SPD, they leverage parks, they leverage SPU to, to do encampment cleans as they call them. And, uh, and then what happens is with the navigation team at the middle of the organizing capacity, other outreach nonprofits can suggest clients to the navigation team and the navigation team will then refer those clients to open shelter units. But all shelters in the city contractually have to report their units to the navigation team. Um, and having that, having that like center point be the, the city of Seattle and the human services department, I think is where uh, some of the biggest contest, contestation has come or the, the biggest concern has come from the advocate and service provider community. Um, it's led to the city council uh, disbanding the navigation team. The mayor came back and kind of put another proposal out that uh, was essentially the same thing in different clothes. It still had the, the human services department at the center of referrals with outreach nonprofits, um, you know, kind of suggesting clients to them. And I think what, what advocates and what our organization is really looking for is how can the city be a resource for outreach nonprofits and how can the outreach nonprofits that know the clients that provide supportive services and that really know the shelters where people are gonna get referred to be the ones to make those connections. Because we, we had to go through a very long month, I wouldn't even say we, we successfully did it, process of trying to essentially train the city staff 
to understand how each tiny house village operated, right? What are the rules here? What are the clients here? What is, what are the, the, the resources? If someone's in a wheelchair, what's the best village for them to go to? Because they are all different. Um, and it was just, it would have just been so much more successful to have a community of outreach workers that know those things, referring to one central organization than to try and kind of build that capacity in the city. Uh, and it also- And, it and was, those it was organizations, those organizations already exist. The people like a church that already provides a meal once a week uh, to homeless people. There's already an organization that works with sex workers in a certain area or provides uh, needles mm -hmm. at the needle exchange. Those organizations already exist and they're perfect for helping you find villagers so that you have a blind spot to it. You don't choose. And that way you can focus on the program and not on only picking people that are easy, you know, because you have a vested interest in doing that. And so I think that's much healthier. And, and I think it's worth pointing out, why would the city um, want to have control over your intakes anyway? It's so that when a neighbor complains about an encampment, they can go there and sweep it, but they don't have to look like bad guys because they offered them a place to stay. So now they're doing good work. Those sweeps are very, very a kindness they're bestowing. And, and so they're trying to take credit for the day-to-day -day effort that you're putting in to creating stable communities um, that are safe for people until they can move forward. Great. And, and just one last piece too is that um, with, within all of this, I mean, uh, a few years ago and still it exists, there are huge um, there are huge racial equity concerns within this work and then the, the disparities that exist within folks that are unsheltered and sheltered is huge. Uh, I, I know that in Seattle it's only, I think there's like, like less than one or around 1% of Seattle's population is native or native Alaskan or Alaskan native um, and about 7% are African American and those numbers um, are kind of quadrupled. It's like about 25% of people that are homeless in Seattle are African American and nearing 10% of people that are homeless in Seattle are uh, indigenous or Alaska native. So those numbers are huge and it also goes even higher up when you look at who's actually using shelters in this city. So there's a, a really high underrepresentation of those marginalized communities in the shelter system. And I can just say that some of the advocacy, looking at the kind of grassroots origin, that's one advocacy route for villages, but a couple of other advocacy routes came very recently when communities of color and marginalized communities really spoke out to the city and demanded um, not only affordable housing, because there are parts of Seattle that have been historically redlined where there's been no investment in housing. There's been incredibly fast gentrification that's gone on. Um, tiny house villages, because it's, you know, it, it still provides a kind of locking door and a sense of community. It's not housing, but it's still something that can slow gentrification and help support local communities. So partnering with service providers that represent those communities and have, have staff that are from those communities, um, choosing locations that are bringing partners in so that it's, this is a resource to the community. There are two or three villages, you know, one village on uh, Yesler in the central area, uh, and it works with predominantly supportive services agencies that work with the black population of Seattle. Um, and the site tends to be about 85% POC when typically it's about 50% POC in most shelters. Um, or less in most shelters in Seattle. So really just like honing in on how can we provide resources in a way that's explicitly anti-racist. Uh, another village is on the property of a, a Baptist church in Seattle, not far from that one. And half of the referral partners work with um, kind of urban native and Alaskan native populations and half of the service providers work with African Americans in Seattle. And so again, that village is 100% POC and that was coming because service providers were speaking out and saying, we do not have a safe place to refer our clients because our clients are not accepting the referrals. The shelters that exist are not good for them. They don't work. The staff don't represent them and aren't from their community. Um, and that was the kind of beginning of what is True Hope Village, which is sponsored by a faith organization and TC Spirit Village, which is also sponsored by a faith organization. You know, I, I think everything you just said is, it's absolutely true and very important. You know, and, and that's what I mean. It's like, we don't even see our own blind spots with who we're going to choose to work with. 
and you need to rely on partners that have that reach that you don't. But, but I think that one other important point is that the idealism behind self-managed groups, right? That if, if you rely on the village to vote people onto the island and vote people off of the island, oh, all of this is gonna be beyond abused. You know, I've seen it time and again. So there definitely needs to be some kind of oversight. You know, you know one discussion, heated discussion I constantly have with the villagers at Interbay um, is we're not voting people off the island. There actually has to be a problem that we've attempted to address numerous times mm -hmm. and we're not voting anyone in because usually the self-managing uh, community, if they're allowed to control intakes as well, it will be a large group of friends. Yeah, I hear that. And um, certainly we also have face the same disparities um, uh, in our community here in Oregon and Portland. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to, um, as we move towards the end of our time with you all, I'd like to touch on some really important um, issues that have been raised by a lot of folks around funding and priorities and kind of community and government buy-in into these approaches. And so I'd be interested to know where does the funding come from for these programs? Um, how much do these programs cost um, to implement? And I know we touched on earlier that the houses themselves are built by volunteers and they cost about $2,500, but I'm interested in like the, the management aspect. And, and as part of that, comparing it to other options as ways to spend, you know, public generally, you know, here in Portland, most of our funds for uh, shelters that come from the government and um, uh, most of them get put into uh, congregate shelters. So how do we compare an investment into a tiny house village as compared to, you know, in Portland, it would be a congregate shelter is kind of the main debate. Um, so I'm interested to hear what you all well, Brad, I know he has all the numbers, but one thing I have to add is that I don't think it's um, a fair comparison to compare the cost to like a, a traditional shelter, because the people that are going to want to be at the tiny house village and are just going to happily fill it, they're not going to go to that shelter, you know, so you're not creating something for them. And also, you know, another comparison could be if you don't want people camping in front of your business or at the park. Yeah, how, what is it compared to putting them all in jail? The thing is, is that these costs are going to be paid by society in one form or another, either through emergency room visits, police hassling poor people, police jailing poor people, um, or cleaning up constantly. You, you know, so there is no way to escape the investment by the taxpayer. And I just think the tiny house village represents the most humane sensible direction to spend that money, but we should never suggest that the money won't be spent. That's a great point. Um, yeah, there was a, maybe we can send it out that the navigation team did some great research to, to survey and poll people that were sleeping outside of what shelter resources would they accept when offered. And it was about 25% of people said they would go to a traditional shelter if it was offered to them. It's about 50% of people that said they'd go to an enhanced shelter. So a 24 seven fully staffed, you can sleep with your partner there. You can bring your pets, you can you know, store your things. That was 50% and 75% of people said that they'd accept a referral to a tiny house village. Um, and yeah, so why don't I, I can share my screen, Sean, if that's okay. Um, to my one second. Sorry, one sec. Okay. Yeah, can you see this screen? It's loading. So this is- There it is. Let me know when. Okay, yep. cool. So this is just, this is an example. This is a breakdown of capital expenditures for a tiny house village to what we would find. Um, so again, this is like looking at the tiny houses. So materials are typically $2,500. Um, if you 
And, and again, I, that's what I would, I would really hone in on this. Like most of our funding comes from the city of Seattle for these programs. And the city of Seattle gets their funding from general fund allocation. They get their funding from most recently the federal government for COVID and most recently from FEMA for reimbursements. So we opened several villages with the city of Seattle in March, April, and May in response to the COVID pandemic. And that funding was getting reimbursed by FEMA. Um, we also have some projects that we're working on right now that are using the COVID dollars that are being distributed by the state of Washington that are available as a part of their sh like shelter grant. Um, so we have two villages that we're working on um, with the counties actually. So the county kind of joint applies with a nonprofit to the state for funding for that. Um, but you know, all of our tiny houses historically have been donated by volunteers and by donors who built the homes. They're totally modular and easily transportable to the site. Um, if that isn't the case, and it's been rare, but sometimes we have done this, that we have to buy a tiny house. Um, it's about twice the cost of materials to have a contractor build a tiny house. Um, it's just important. So example, 25, 25 tiny houses would do about $125,000 for a village if you're buying them all. Um, but this is again, where I'd really stress like local trade programs, schools that want to build, you know, volunteers that want to build, there's so much community engagement that is possible within those relationships. And I really encourage, um, especially in Portland, that's a great way to bring people in and to get people involved and to build ownership, right? To like help a community feel like they built something. Um, all of a sudden you'll go from like maybe nimbyism to like, I built this. What do you mean it's not working? It has my fingerprints on it. Like I helped build, like I did the trim on that window. Isn't that great? Um, so in terms of site prep for a village, um, electrical is maybe $50,000. Plumbing might be the same, totally variable on the site. If there's a side sewer, if there's a water service, um, gravel, grading, you know, usually villages aren't big enough to need like extensive permits for, for regrading, but it is important to have like some kind of crushed rock surface um, so that people can move around. Some villages we have have an asphalt pathway where people can move to, to some of the key areas. Um, hygiene structures, those are about $60,000 and that varies from a, you know, a couple of tiny houses that are converted into buildings that is bought and purchased and turned into to, um, hygiene buildings. Um, or there's a third option I can't remember, but um, yeah, buying like a, an Airstream style um, trailer. So there's lots of different methods there. I would always make sure that whatever you buy is gonna work with a local permitting group. So L and I, um, if something is, if you're building a tiny house and you're building it somewhere else and it's gonna come and dro get dropped off onto the site, be very careful about who has to inspect all of those pieces if it does require a permit. We've been hit several times. Sometimes we've just moved through it and they've been okay. Sometimes we've had to tear out all of the walls of the hygiene buildings so that the local municipality can see every component before we put the walls back on. Um, and then this, yeah, this is just some other cost. So um, I will pull up again um, another So this is just, this is an example um, of a development and operation cost. So within this, you have a supportive services budget, which is funding for a case manager, maybe two case managers, uh, someone to help supervise that case manager, their office things. There's also client assistance, which is sometimes as big as 30 or $50,000 to help folks with first month's rent, with security deposit, moving costs, a number of different things. Um, there's an operations budget and that, that varies. And I'll, I'll speak more to where this village fits in, um, but this would be a site manager and maybe another site manager or a site manager with a couple of people on site that are paid part-time to help do some of the management work, but it's not full 24 seven security and management and, and site staff. Whereas with that's articulated within that operations budget figure. Um, and then administration, and then within operations, the supplies, all of the water, all of the garbage, sewer, all those things, um, which comes out to about $18 per day per person for a village of 70 residents. That's a large village. We have a, I don't know, Andrew of Georgetown's ever had 70 people, um, probably 65, but maybe never 70. 
Um, and then capital expenditure, again, site setup might be $300,000 and the tiny houses themselves might be $150,000. Um, this is, so this is a budget that we recently prepared and this was for uh, a group that was interested in doing a tiny house village. Um, it was, this village would serve very high needs individuals, people who have uh, chronic substance use, mental illness, and who've been homeless for a very long time. Uh, and the site itself didn't have utilities. So there was a pretty extensive need to bring a sewer on, go into the street, get a permit for that, bring it in, all these other things. So this is like per capita, probably the, the biggest budget I've seen um, for any of these programs. It includes five full-time village organizers, which means that there's one person there during the day as a, a site manager. There is another person there during the day who helps to help letting people into the door, working with folks, helping to make sure the kitchen is clean, helping to make sure the site is like, the people are getting along, that it's working well. Um, and then it also covers full 24 seven staff around the clock. So that again, this is where the economy of scale comes in and doing that high of a service model for only 25 tiny houses becomes less cost effective. Yeah, doing it on a location where there is no sewer, no water, significant need to regrade and do gravel, um, that also makes that, that initial setup quite high. Uh, and so for one year of operations with setup, it was $1.3 million. So I don't think we've done a project that's ever cost that much, um, but that's just as an example how expensive they can get. Great. Thank you. you. You know, and, and I think that it's worth mentioning, like in that example, it has five 24 hour staff people that you're gonna have to pay. And that, that's that's how you do it. If you're gonna work with, as Brad describing a high need population, that's your only choice. Um, but, you know, like the alternative where you have like one site manager and maybe a case manager or two, um, you know, often getting villagers invested in it you know, caring about the village is really like the main aspect of my job, right? And teaching them how to deal with complicated situations. Um, and so I just rely on, um, you know, in any homeless community, there's going to be like a street mom or a street dad, you know, who feed people, offer some protection and support. And so, you know, I just say, street mom, let's be friends, you know, let's you and me work together to care about the village. And the, I think the villagers really respond to that, you know, when they have a, a little more flexibility and they are part of the community. And some of the like uh, ways that I grease the wheels are, I have like a leadership meeting with the village leaders that are elected by the group. And I make Lehigh buy us all coffee, you know, for our meeting, you know, to, to kind of butter people up a little bit to be a little more amendable to meeting and dis discussing village matters. Um, and and I, I think that both work really well. It's just really based on the population uh, that you're working with. And, and I'll, I don't, I've never seen Andrew blush, but um, I will say, and Hattie too, who's, who's on this video. Um, but I'll just say that having, having people on our team who understand more of what it's like to be in a tiny house and who can relate to people that are living in, in a tiny house or that are in these programs um, can do some of that like organizing work that can't be codified and it can't really be written down in some of those ways. Um, that is an, an unquantifiable resource to any program is having that kind of connection with people and having people who know people and who love people. So again, there's I, I don't, I would never say that, um, that that's a substitute for adequate staffing, uh, but I would say that it is an irreplaceable element in, in one perspective on success. And both Andrew and Hattie and the people that come to mind, Eric, Chris, you get people who, people who have lived experience and are just amazing at what they do because I think they really love people. Um, and I don't think our organization would be at all the same if it didn't have such an amazing team of folks. Well, I, I agree about all the nice things you said about me. I don't know about the others, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that like the drift towards you know a more staffed village um, is partly because of the demographics of the people you're trying to help, but also because that is an unreliable way to replicate villages. You you can't always wait 
for Ibrahim Mubarak to emerge to start your new village. You, you know, it's, it's like when those things coalesce and you have an individual um, who their heart is in it, they're absolutely dedicated to that work, then you're lucky. But it, it, if you want to do 10 villages, it's hard to find those 10 people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just want to give you an opportunity. We're going to wrap up this portion of the forum today. But if there's any last parting words that Bradford or Andrew, you want to share with us as um, we continue our journey here down in Portland and in Oregon of um, uh, villages to support on house folks, I'll give you that opportunity. Any parting words? Well, I'll say that in doing any villages, um, especially multiple, I'm sure you guys are well aware of it in Oregon, that probably the number one prob problem you're going to have, the root of it is methamphetamine. You know, and so any advocacy work that you might be involved with should definitely be involved in creating treatments for methamphetamine, whether replacement therapy with Ritalin or whatever they have cooked up, but it is definitely one of the biggest challenges that meth methamphetamine appeals to people uh, that are unsheltered uh, because it makes it so you don't need to eat, you don't need to sleep, you're hypervigilant if you feel as though you might be under attack. And so it's, it's definitely been the most disruptive and element and created the most problems. Um, so just be ready to deal with it, you know? And I, I think that, um, you know, it's not to say that those are bad people. It's just that meth is the devil and it will drive you crazy, even if you don't do it. Um, and I think my parting word is nothing new. It's just, a, I guess, um, zooming back in on how tiny houses have changed some of the public perception around shelters and folks experiencing homelessness and that, um, you know, to someone who's like doing a cost analysis, tiny houses make sense. Um, I think they make sense from a cost standpoint. I think that like that kind of private space makes a lot of sense from a programming standpoint, makes a lot of sense from a, how do you quickly get something set up? When COVID hit, we, we set up a village and from, from truly like touching the ground to having first people move in, it was four weeks. Um, and it was a fully set up site and it, you know, we didn't need to do anything. We weren't still working on it when the first person moved in. The first person moved in, all our volunteers were gone to make sure that wasn't exposure. So like there's that component of this, but I also just think that um, by providing some of those like small elements of home, whether it's a locking door, whether it's a roof, whether it's a heater, um, not only is it, can you see, and, and I think we can attest to having seen people really transform from those spaces. If they haven't had a locking door in such a long time, that's one of the first things that we hear from a lot of people is like, I haven't had a locking door in such a long time. A locking door is mentioned. So while it's not all about the tiny houses, that I think is a big component. And I think it's also a huge way to create this wave of empathy and love in neighbors who might otherwise be against the population, but the model is compelling. And it, it looks like the gable roof that they grew up in, um, you know, it looks like a dollhouse. It looks like it's like these, it, it's imprinted in our built environment. And um, I think it's a way to really like humanize people uh, just as that like subtle reminder that, that people are people no matter where they live. You know, I, I have to say one more thing <laughs> is that's right. But, you know, I often think that the do-gooders, it's easy to make them want to do this. That's not really the challenge. You know, the challenge is the people that want to sue you or want all poor people to, you know, be imprisoned or run out of the city and tarred and feathered. And, but I think that there, there's a, the dark arts where you can appeal to them too. It's like, do you want people in the RV on your street? Do you want all these tents camped right next to your business? Or would you prefer you get out of our way and let us help those people and create a community where they're allowed to be we know their name and we're trying to help them. So get out of the way. We're trying to help you too. So I, I think it's important to appeal to those that are way less sympathetic, you know, and have them help them to understand what you're trying to do and how it will benefit them. Appeal to people's selfishness at the same time that you appeal to their uh, compassion. And, and also 
transparency is how you get the neighborhood to like the village. You know, once you're open, once we do like a monthly report to na a neighborhood group, and I tell them we had four police calls, four police interactions at the village. And of course, I respect people's privacy. I don't name names, but I characterize what it was about so that they understand. And the more honest and open you are about the challenges that you have, the more people will trust you and grow to care about the village. Well, I just really want to thank both um, you, Andrew and Bradford for joining us and everyone at Lehigh for attending. We really appreciate it. I mean, we're, there's a lot of discussions around this issue and it's great to have some different perspective from folks who have been doing this work um, and our neighbors to the north. So we hope we can do this again sometime and we hope we, we plan on staying in touch, obviously. Um, so thanks again. And we're gonna be, what we're going to do now until noon is we're gonna talk about the goal that we've set up for kind of this emerging coalition and talk about some action steps. So Lehigh folks, feel free to stick around if you want, but you're welcome to go and thank, thank you again. And um, for the rest of us in Portland and in Oregon who wanna stick around and talk about taking some of this information and turning it into action, that's what we're gonna be doing, so. Thank you all so much. Thank yes, you, thank you guys. for facilitating, much appreciated. Yeah, thank and you. if any of you want to email me or whatever, or I'll, I'll give you a video tour of the village, you can meet some villagers, whatever, you're welcome to do that. Or if you want to hear more of my obtuse uh, ob observations, I'm happy to share those. <laughs> and likewise, I just shared my, um, my email. So I, I will not pontificate the way that Andrew will, but I'll send you a document if you'd like it. Okay, sounds good. And I'll be, in addition to sending out this video, I will share um, uh, some links to some of the information that um, Bradford and Lehigh have shared with us. So moving on to the next portion, um, uh, as I touched on at the very beginning of this uh, meeting, um, the Northeast Coalition of Neighborhoods and the Interfaith Alliance um, came together earlier this year. We also partnered with Tim McCormick, who's an organizer at Village Collaborative, and we put on the first um, alternative shelter and village forum in, at the end of June. Um, I think some of you attended that and building on that forum, uh, discussion around alternative shelters and villages. We've continued to work. Um, there's been a core organizing team and we've expanded it to include some other community leaders uh, in the area. And we've developed, uh, we were hoping Raven was going to be here, but she's, uh, she's, in, she's in a meeting, so I'm going to share it. Let me open up my screen. Um, we developed a draft goal, and here's our updated draft goal. Oop. Share. Through commute, uh, sorry, draft goal is through collaborative community action, we will increase and or expand the alternative shelters and villages now to ensure a safe and decent place for everyone to rest, secure their belongings, and find community. We will center on the needs and voices of those with lived experience. We will improve both the quantity and quality of alternative shelters and villages throughout our community, and we will support self-determination for both the management of alternative shelters and villages and their individual residents. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to get some feedback from this group on what folks think about this draft um, goal. And if people want to, one way of sharing your feedback, you could post something in the chat, that's welcome, or you could do a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you know how to do that on the, um, or you could just give a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Does anyone have any suggestions to make this draft goal better? Looking around, and you can raise your hand or you could just unmute. Okay. Hey, Sean. 
Hi, Sue. What's your suggestion? Well, I entered it in there and I said, it's great. I suggest, you know, goal in terms of strategic planning is somewhat uh, granular. So you there might be a vision statement that evolves from what you've put here that's overarching to the region that our vision is that we have these villages, blah, 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 like you said. And then our mission then is to develop those villages and then our goals are, you know, more specifically to have this kind of village, that kind of village, and then we would have a value system and so forth. But good, good start. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate that. Any, anyone else? I saw another hand raised before. Feel free to unmute and share. Yes. Um, I can't. See. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, um, I, this isn't particularly about the goal statement, but um, just that in in Seattle, I was really impressed with the fact that they have the Lehigh organization, which is statewide, apparently in Washington, the Low Income Housing Institute. Um, and we, I don't think we have anything like that in Oregon. And so seeing how they you know, they have a model to try to work to towards duplicating. Um, I think it would be really important to not try to to reinvent the wheel when you can see that something is working really well someplace else to try and um, utilize what they've developed and try and duplicate. Yeah. Um, from my understanding, I I think Lehigh primarily focuses on the Puget Sound area. And, um, you know, as we heard previously, in addition to operating urban restaurant, urban rest stops and tiny house villages, they also operate um, affordable housing projects as, and develop them. But I agree, um, having more capacity within our own communities to support these types of efforts is important. Well, People can feel free to, if they've got further comments on the draft goal, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, unless I hear any other suggestions, I think we'll move. Oh, you no, know, Sean, I was just oh, wondering yeah. if there's a timeline on this. Because right now we have three villages um, that C3PO is, is working really hard uh, to take to the next level. Um, and engagement with those three um, emergency alternative shelter camps, especially the one in Old Town, um, would be very productive. We also have the Agape Village uh, that could use some support um, out there. And, you know, honestly, I think it's great to make more, but I think before we make more, adding support and structure to the ones that we have right in front of us um, and is extremely important. The city has just contracted with us to build 110 platforms to put underneath the tents that are there. They're also looking at taking um, a closer look at what can be done just to support each individual that are living on the platforms. Um, and I, I don't really want to talk more about exactly what's going on with that. But, uh, I say if people are interested, let's engage right now. How about evolving C-3PO camps into tiny villages by beefing up the structures from tents to Conestoga huts, for example? Yeah, I think yep, both, of, both of those are really- we're building the platforms because if you mm -hmm. build the platforms, we can frame out individual houses directly onto the platforms. Yeah. Right, Al? <laughs> I'll also add that there's a budget hearing on the 20th, I think, 21st and 28th. 28th is the official budget hearing where they're gonna be, um, there's an appeal out to get people to speak in support of more funding for the C3PO camps. I'll look up the link for that, but um, we may wanna also advocate with the city that we should invest mm -hmm. more in the camps because they've got the place to do it and they've got kind of a few systems in place. Yeah, and the next um, 
point on the agenda, which uh, Carol Turner is going to take, is going to be focused on kind of next steps. Um, really, the thought behind the goal is kind of an overarching goal to inform um, uh, kind of our work generally. And we've got a number of different advocacy avenues that we plan on engaging in uh, as a group. And I think I saw Tim uh, had a comment or question. Yeah, can you hear me? Um, I just wanted to say about the goal and uh, which I like and <clears throat> building on what Sue said about perhaps um, shaping it to a vision and a mission. I think there's kind of a, uh, a common tension between like go fast and go slow and like what's the ultimate vision versus like what's reasonable steps to do now. Or another way to put it is like the, the, the complete goal versus like piloting. And so, um, <clears throat> and I think those both have their values. And if you try to sort of put them, smudge them into one, it may do neither. And so um, with this, an, an angle that we talked about earlier in this organizing was having, having a very aspirational, but also fairly concrete vision, which is to say like, offer every Portlander a safe and decent place to sleep this year. And it, it's kind of like, it, it, it's big, in my opinion, not that big, you know, achievable. But it's also concrete, like you could say yes or no whether that happened. But of course, like, that doesn't tell you what to do tomorrow. And so then you have like, you know, mission is, you know, gets into that. And that might be like, you know, build our pilots or something. So I, I echo Sue's point and on that. <clears throat> Great. Okay, with that, I think I'm going to turn things over to Carol to talk through our next agenda item. Yeah. Thank you. And a big thank you to Bradford and Andrew. I was so moved by that presentation and excited about it. It's great to get some hands on staff and a, uh, appreciation that the staff from Lehigh also joined in some other members. That was very helpful to have them kind of filling in on the chat and a thanks to Sean also for kind of connecting with them and bringing that to us today. I think it was really, really helpful. So um, again, we've had kind of a planning team, which is met, which has consisted of about 15 to 20 people. Some of you have participated in that to have several sessions. We've worked with Amy Carlson, a, a facilitator consultant, who's I think on here too, who's really helped us kind of keep this moving forward, but keeping it nimble and open also. So we're still in the early development stage. Um, just, <clears throat> we, we've talked about some of the needs here, really, how do you build pu public will? How do you build political will? The issue of funding, the issue of leadership, all of those broad things. Um, Sean, if you wanna share the screen on this, that'd be great. We'll sure. talk about, um, really our key strategy here is that we're talking about is forming some sort of active coalition and network to advance this goal, which is kind of our working goal for now, and it will evolve, I'm sure. Um, <clears throat> and we've talked about um, kind of three midterm ongoing areas. Um, one, uh, developing an overarching advocacy strategy, key messages to engage with local jurisdictions that we, we definitely need to do. And if you're interested in working on that, let us know. Um, obviously seeing that this is really related to partnerships, building bridges, weaving connections with the Village Coalition, Northwest Pilot Projects, um, Navigation Center, all those range of partners that we need to be building with. And I think the Seattle group emphasized that. And then just also really supporting system change program, continuous improvement efforts as we go forward as all of us work together. So those are those midterm ongoing things. But then um, we really talked about some near-term actions and we can add more, but um, so these are three things that have continued to come up that are really um, kind of hopping right now. Uh, one is to have input and recommendations on the Portland shelter to housing continuum. That's come up. I saw Al Burns was on this. Um, he started to, to roll out their rec early recommendations yesterday, yesterday, I think it was. <laughs> We've had two people who have volunteered and this is when we're suggesting the near term, what we're saying is we really, I think, see the idea that th these would be work groups or study groups who would then form recommendations and also form an advocacy plan for how to carry forth what advocacy is needed where and with whom and 
what are those recommendations that then we will float out to the larger or to the other organizations. Many of you are here to say, would you sign on to this? How does this work for you? You know, would you sign on to the recommendations? So again, get, giving input and recommendations and two people, Sean Green and Sarah Corellis are kind of the initial point people. They're just simply the ones who will kind of convene these meetings. Um, input and recommendations on the uh, local implementation plan um, for the Metro dollars. Um, I'm willing and Helen Ying are willing to be the point people for this. And um, also then uh, Commissioner Jayapal from the county is definitely very interested in safe parking options for Chief of Staff Sarah Ryan is going to be one of the point people will have, probably have somebody else. So um, in just a few minutes, we'll ask you kind of team one is uh, just to indicate in the chat if you're willing and interested in being considered. Again, we, we don't know how long this may take. I mean, some group, some of the groups may, you know, meet three or four times, get their recommendations together and um, uh, be, uh, and, and then it could say, go into hiatus. We, we simply don't know at these points how these will flow up, but we'll have the three, um, three kind of study groups, work groups at this point on that. Um, so we'll ask you in a few minutes. Now I did hear again, energy around looking, you know, kind of from Andy Olshan and looking at, um, okay, so what, what are some immediate uh, kind of pressure points are there about looking at, at taking some of these? Um, obviously, looking at the money through implementation plan, some of these all have to do with that. But if there's additional interest um, in terms of near, near term, are there some people who really want to look at some specific advocacies and development along Andy's line of what can you do to enhance um, and build on the ones we already have starting there? So um, we might, Sean, if you don't mind, can you? Can you type into that fourth one and see if there's, I think the question is, is there energy around this? Um, I don't know quite how we want to say it, but um, so. Uh, And then we will just simply ask you to, and you can start already if you know there's one of those that you want to work on. Again, in the order, team one, two, three, four. Um, if you would just put that in the chat and then we can capture that because we definitely need people who either because of their passion or their professions or whatever are interested in, in working on kind of what if as a loose coalition, how are we going to impact these issues? So. Any kind of questions on that? And I'm gonna need Sean's help and, and Amy's help and seeing if there's um, that. Um, any questions? So, um, Andy, how about putting you as a point person for that fourth one? <laughs> sure. Is that fine? Okay. I mean, that you could be one one of them. To volunteer at any particular village or at any particular time, um, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, uh, we are working at one of the villages uh, or at our build site on Capitol Highway. But okay. you know, I think Michaela Smith, are you around? Are you? I saw your name in there and she has been- I am here, hi. Yay, could you talk a little bit about the needs of Agape right now and what people might uh, be able to do to support Agape? Sure. And we have about one or two, one or two minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll keep it brief. Thanks, so um, Agape Village has been doing really well through COVID. Our next big goal is to build some infrastructure to get sort of a bricks and mortar bathhouse up there for folks and to run electricity to the pods to um, so that they can have heat and, you know, in, in pod electricity. So that's our next big fundraising goal for, two, for our next fiscal year. Um, we, you know, volunteering is limited because of COVID, um, but if you're interested, you may always reach out to us, of course. Um, I'm sure we can, we can find a way to put you to, put you to work, but um, 
electricity and, and utilities are our next big goal for 2021. So you can donate at Agape PDX or excuse me, Agape Village PDX.org. Um, and you can always reach out to me if you would like to know more. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Michaela. Yeah, great. So any other kind of questions about any of those kind of near term things? And um, also, if you're in indicate in the chat, if you're interested in some of the longer term issues, too, um, which are kind of more overarching. Um, so while we're wrapping this up, um, any kind of additional ideas that kind of that you found yourself reflecting about um, that actions we should be thinking about or implications for our actions that we should be thinking about that we really heard from Lehigh today. We didn't have a time for reflection on that, but um, again, uh, hoping Amy and I'm not seeing hands here, so it's really hard to, yeah. Yeah. Any reflections that you had about that presentation? I wanted to mention Tim McCormick here. Uh, uh -huh, that yeah. Any, um, around the time of some, to clarify something, around the time of the first forum in June, we set up and uh, then the PDX shelter forum, and it's been running ever since, and I'm moderating right. that. And that's kind of been um, the sort of the public or public participatory forum face of this, yeah. but, but at this point is a little bit ambiguously related to other efforts. And the, the strategy that has been talked about from time to time is something like there are different branches of an effort for PDX shelter forum is kind of the, uh, like the broader welcome to all, even welcoming people who might totally disagree, you know, in that like everyone can come to a forum. You, you're not saying you even agree. And we might even welcome that to uh, to, ch to challenge and test our ideas. But anyway, um, and that also this hasn't gone very far, but it but it, it it is a web presence, and there's like a rudimentary wiki there that can be an interim place to put things, or but it can it, it may be to stage to evolve somewhere else. But also anyone can sign up to join. There's 200 some people on it, and what I'm trying to do, or what we're trying to do, is is regularly post and be a, a, a sort of reliable source for things like this, like share this video, for example. So yeah. welcome everybody to that. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Yeah. So <clears throat> yeah, yeah thoughts? Quick, quick suggestion that we should maybe consider that we look at this from a regional perspective because um, of the way Metro plans for the region, I think mm. um, that would be a good set of data layers to use and just a good way to have a perspective, probably tie it to the 2040 plan in some capacity rather than limiting it to the city or the county. Mm -hmm. And that's just big picture. And so that sort of interests me is the idea of having a framework and as all the ideas pop up, hanging them on and filling in this uh, regional picture. Cause we've known for a long time that these villages are a very good thing. And at some point we have to get critical mass to, to start doing them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and uh, get, I guess, the electeds and the uh, city and stuff more on board. Mm -hmm. That regional vision and plan, I think, would be. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Janice, and then I think we're about ending um, Yeah, Janice. So at, one, at one point, we talked a lot about um, the problem of having uh, so many people bunched into certain areas of the city who were looking for homes or, or villages or tents and so forth. And I would like to know how that's going to be uh, looked at through the prioritization of funding, because we heard that again at the forum yeah. in Lent saying, well, we, we, you need to pay more attention to our community. And I know Helen Ying is on your council, and mm -hmm. I know that she knows well what, go, what's, you know, what they have downtown. But how do you put that into a way that says, let's make sure that we pay mm -hmm. attention to the areas and arenas where we are most impacted. That's one thing. Now I'm going to say something else real quick. I would love to join the Jayapal team to, for overnight. Okay, uh, great. Camping good. things. Put my good idea. I, don't, I don't want to be a leader, but I want to be a good supporter. Good work. Yeah, good. If you would put your name in, that'd be great. Sarah's smiling on that. <laughs> I can see that's great. Okay, good, good. Yeah, well, I think the idea of how does this connect with the with the broader region is um, is a real 
issue and across the community. And really in terms of the draft goal, that language was just added to improve the quality and the quantity of this throughout the community, really stating that clearly, that um, recognizing that it doesn't do well to concentrate it. So, okay, any other items you're welcome to either quickly put them into the chat. Um, I had a let, quick comment. Let, um, I'm sorry, who's that? I can't see that. My name is Sharon Fuchs. I just, Hi, I had Sharon. my hand yeah. up. Well, one last comment as we close I had a today. real quick comment. You know, there's many people on participating in this and each person has different points of their outreach and I happened to get a survey from Metro asking about what I would or would not do about writing the, the max and I took that opportunity to say that we needed help and safety and plugged um, Andrew Olshan's group and said if we could make it safer by X, Y, and Z. So I strongly encourage everybody to take every survey they is, <laughs> there is that you could possibly connect the dots with what you're trying to do here mm -hmm. and get the word out. And if you want certain points of contacts, um, give that information out to everybody and say, if you're taking a survey, send them to us. Send them to yeah. us, send them to us. Thank oh, you. Sharon, Sharon, that's a wonderful last comment to remember that advocacy begins with each one of us. Taking each one of us. Thank each you. Each one of us with those simple, quote, simple acts, but yet getting the voices out. So just again, stay tuned. There's lots happening related to this. Clearly, there's a momentum and um, kind of we see ourselves really as this evolving coalition. And we, you know, are delighted that so many of you joined us today. And I think we're all excited about it getting a bit kind of real visible model that of a city that's really tackling this issue. So it was very moving and inspiring. And again, thanks for you all for, for joining today, hanging in for a couple hours, stay safe and stay tuned for more information. So bye. <laughs>